I'm Vince Long, president of the Dell Home Service League. I'd like to welcome everyone to this program today. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're happy to have a series of programs. Uh, these months, we're sort of focusing on North Carolina potters. And this program from Leah Leitzen was originally scheduled for last spring at the beginning of the pandemic, and we had to cancel. Um, I'd like to think that this was sort of the end, tail end of the pandemic, but I think we still got a few months to, to go on that. Um, but we've got a lot of guests uh, in the room. So thank you again for joining us. Thanks to Susan Coyman, who handles all of our publicity and communications. She's done a great job of trying to get the word out uh, about this. If you're not on our mailing list and would like to know about uh, programs coming up in the future, uh, you can send an email to DellHomeServiceLeague at gmail.com to be added to the wait list. And I'm going to quickly share my screen and show we've made an enhancement to the Potter's Market website. Uh, if you're familiar with the website for our signature event, Potter's Market at the, at the Mint, uh, we have a website, simply pottersmarketatthemint.com. If you go to that website, you'll come to this page and we've added a link. Let me draw this real quick up here in the top corner, a little navigation uh, point that if you click on that, it'll take you to this page about the Dell Home Service League. And we've added some links here to show where you can look at the schedule of upcoming programs, a link to our YouTube channel where um, recordings of our programs are posted. And we've also created a guide of some other videos put out by other ceramics organizations that might be of interest. If you're looking for some content, uh, there's a lot of rich information out on the web. And these are just a few of the links that we've identified. And we'll add to that as we find some, some additional ones. So that's just one little um, tip if you want to um, go to that. Also, during the call today, if you um, use the chat function and send a little chat note to me uh, with your email, again, we can add that to the, to the mailing list for future programs. So with that, um, I think we will turn it over. I'm gonna turn it over to Herb Cohen, one of our vice presidents for programs who helped arrange today's session and let him do the introduction of Leah, and we'll just get started with, with that. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you all here. We're so happy to have Leah Leitzen with us today. She's a professor of ceramics at Warren Wilson College in Asheville. She was born in Flint, Michigan, and was introduced into, in ceramics as a child at the Flint Institute of Art and later as an adult attended the John C. Campbell Folk School and the professional craft ceramic program at Haywood Community College in North Carolina. After years working as a studio potter, Leah went on to earn her BFA at Alfred University. Her education continued with residencies at the Archie Bray Foundation and the Banff Center for the Arts and a sabbatical at the Gulagagard International Research Center in Denmark, and a ceramic-focused tour of Jinsen, China. She is widely respected as an educator and maker of functional wear in porcelain. She has taught workshops at the Aramont School of Crafts, the Penland School of Crafts, the Meridiana International School of Ceramics in Italy, as well as a guest artist in Israel and throughout the United States. Her work has been featured in books and magazines and museum collections. And now Leah has prepared a 12 minute video program to start the uh, program now. Leah. Thank you, Herb. Thank you for that nice introduction. I'm going to share my screen now.
Hey, welcome everybody. Come on in. Welcome everyone to our home. This is where I live with my husband, Martin Tatarka in Asheville, North Carolina. Our home is a 1927 craftsman style bungalow that we did in addition to seven or eight years ago. Uh, we have ceramics throughout the house, but that's a larger story. I wanted to start here in the kitchen this morning as we uh, get started. If we were in person, we would be having coffee or tea and mingling a little bit before I gave a lecture, getting a chance to know one another. And if you were here at my home, I'd be asking you to pick a cup for tea or coffee that I would serve you. Often potters make cups as part of their repertoire of work. We have a variety of cups. Also, they all can't fit on this mug wall and we often rotate them out. But when I'm teaching students about cups, I often talk about the handle and the rim and how important they are to the form in many ways, how it integrates, how it feels in the hand. And one of the most important elements I feel is the rim and how it feels when it touches your mouth. It's the one form we make that we bring to our lips. I'm going to pick this cup here made by Alex Matisse from East Fork Pottery. This is a wood-fired cup that he made over 10 years ago. This is my go-to cup for many reasons. One is it's shallow and it fits under the porta filter at ease. It's also very comfortable in the handle and the rim and exceptionally good for a wide mouth for the foam not to settle into the cup. If it was a smaller rim, it would sink. So this is my go-to cup. I never get tired of it. And uh, it's the cup I use every day. So we have another cup that is often used, a latte cup, uh, this one here. And it's, it's shallow and, and also used for our daily lattes. This is one my husband uses, and I thought this would be the opportunity to introduce him. He is a big supporter of my work. He's an artist also himself, and you'll hear me speak more about him later this morning when we talk about our collaborations that we often do together. Here's Martin. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome everybody uh, to our home. Uh, this is a cup. I bought in Denver, Colorado at the Cherry Creek Arts Festival. It's made by Matthew Jorgensen. And uh, it's a cup that I use pretty much daily in the morning while I'm having my coffee and reading the newspaper. One of the things I like about it, well, and there's many things, I like the clean lines. I like the separation here. And so you get to see the clay body. I love the rim and the interior color. And uh, Leah has taught me a lot about handles. So uh, when I was at his booth, I, I went through many of the cups just to put my finger through this, this handle to make sure that it would fit, that it was a good fit. I found this one and it seems to do the job. Uh, for the married folks out there, as you know, each year on your anniversary, there's a special material that uh, is for gifts. The first year of your anniversary or your first anniversary is paper. For your eighth anniversary, it's pottery. So every piece tells a story about an artist or a connection or a place or time some I don't use very often, some I may use for a very specific occasion, some inform my work, and some I use as teaching tools. These are all pieces in the kitchen that would be go-to pieces that I would use on a daily basis. Over here, we have another cup wall, but also with a few various items. And uh, one of the pieces here I'd like to just mention is this cup, 
that is one of my favorites. I brought it back from Jingdezhen, China, and it was made from a, by a friend of mine, actually. It's slipcast. It has a buttery satin white glaze on the exterior and a beautiful celadon translucent piece on the inside. I think uh, I like this piece so much because it's something that maybe I aspire to. And it brings back a memory I have of one of my professors, Wayne Higby, who once mentioned that we often relate to work that is similar to our own. I also, since we mentioned the anniversary gift, uh, this is another piece by Brian Hopkins Ceramics that was also purchased in Denver at that same time uh, for the anniversary gift of ceramics. Okay, so we're going to head to the studio, which is just the building out back, and I'll see you there. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my studio. I'm going to give you a couple minutes just to look around and then I'm going to share with you a little bit about the studio space. So as a potter, I work in a series or I could say variations on a theme. And this oval bowl has been a form that I've been intrigued with for many years and it has evolved. And most recently it took a turn over the holiday break when I had time to work and I started making them once again, but treating the rim differently. Uh, so I've, I have these areas here protruding from the rim to give a, a variation here. So I wanted to talk last about a body of work that Martin and I create together. It's titled LM for Leah and Martin. Martin has a painting and drawing background as well as sculpture. And he often looks at my work as blank canvases and is just biting at the bit to decorate. So we came up with a line of work that he is using a slip for decoration. We salt fire the work and we make the vases. We've made these occasion cups for special occasions that come in a, a box that Martin has created with a box with a lid. And then uh, we have also worked with cork and clay. This is a creamer and sugar with a cork lid and cork handle. And this stems from a time when I was teaching at Penland and he was able to take a course of his choice as a perk. And he chose this cork class. And this was a, a, something that came out of that time period. But we've enjoyed working with cork. We have it here with cups, the creamer and sugar. And then last is most recently, we've been doing some slip casting together. And I'm going to let Martin speak a little bit to that. Hi. I'd like to talk a bit about our project in slip casting. Slip casting is a process in which we can make multiples of the same form in ceramic. But first you have to start out with a form. In this case, we started out with a lathe turned uh, form and then we added a spout. And uh, from there, we had to make a two piece mold. And in this mold, we poured in uh, slip, which is liquefied clay. It sits in there. And while, while it's sitting in there, water is drawn from, from the uh, slip into the plaster. And then the remaining is poured out. And then after a while, we can take the mold apart and we're left with the, the form. This is hollow. So in this form, we're thinking about a, a pitcher and a pitcher with a handle. Handle is very important. So here are some of the experiments we're dealing with here.
I don't know if all of them can fit up there. But you can see how it changes the personality and adds character to it. Does it complement the form? Does it make it more feminine? Does it make it more masculine? All these are things that we're looking at. When Leah was in uh, doing her sabbatical in uh, Denmark, we went to Helsinki, Finland. And there we saw a line of chairs called about a chair. And in thinking about uh, the designer asking that question about a chair, what is it about a chair? Is it the leg? Is it the back? Is it the seat? Is it the arm? These are all elements of a chair and that make up a, either a good chair or a bad chair. But here we're looking at handle. And uh, we're asking the viewer to consider the handle as important as the form. So this is a project we're calling About a Handle. Welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed seeing our home and studio. It's so nice to have so many of you here and thank you for coming. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a lay of the land. I'm going to now share a PowerPoint of my work and then I'll stay on for a little bit to show you a few images of, uh, that I have for teaching through the pandemic currently, and then I'm gonna come back on so I can be with you so we don't have to go back and forth and we'll have more of a conversation and dialogue at that time. So from here, I'm gonna go back and share my screen. I'm gonna to go to here. Whoops, sorry about that. Great. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that every pot has a story. Well, we all have a story. And I thought I would share the evolution of how I got started in ceramics. I often share with my students that there's many paths to get to where you might wanna be. Some students will go from high school to college or will take a gap year or several years before they figure out if it's college or something else that they would choose to do. So this is my path and how I got started. As Herb mentioned earlier, I'm originally from Flint, Michigan, home of Buick, home of Michael Moore, who home of Michael Moore, who put, the, put Flint on the map with his movie, Roger and Me. Well, as we all know Flint now with having lead in its water. Growing up in Flint, I took pottery classes as a hobby at the Flint Art Institute. But it was later that I discovered the John C. Campbell Folk School in Brasstown, North Carolina. And it was here that when I first arrived, I learned that students were there in trade for room and board. And I applied the following year and stayed the entire year to work with Lee Davis, who was the resident potter at that time. This is a picture of Lee and me. In the week. Um, so this is a picture of the two of us on the wheel, and it's a wheel that Lee designed to teach a blind student how to throw, where the wheel head is in the center of the two of us, and the teacher and the student can feel the movement of the clay in the hands. It's a great teaching technique, and one that I've used many times over the years to teach my ceramic students how to throw. 
From here, I went on to Haywood Technical Institute, which was a two-year crafts production program in wood, clay, weaving, or jewelry. It's now called Haywood Community College. It's a wonderful college, state-of-the-art facilities, and it was then and still is today. When I left Haywood, I left with a fellow classmate of mine, Lynn Jenkins, and we opened up a studio in Blowing Rock, North Carolina. And it was here that I taught my first class in Wilkesboro. I believe I had two students. I started doing craft fairs, but I also had the privilege to meet Herb Cohen. And it was Herb who encouraged me to apply to Alfred State College of Ceramics, where I completed my BFA degree. And I'm so thankful for his encouragement and glad that I listened to him. Thank you, Herb. And upon graduating, I made, this is the work I was making at that time. I was focused on tea sets, was intrigued with all the different components of putting them all together. I was also using slip as a decorative approach to the surfaces of my pieces. And this was a technique that I had learned from a visiting professor one summer, Chris Staley, who had taught me that slip technique. I was very much drawn to atmospheric firings for the rich surfaces that one could achieve through salt or wood. I moved to North Carolina, to Asheville, upon graduating from Alfred, and I found this great studio space that housed about 15 different artists who worked in different mediums. And it was here that I felt that my work was beginning to say Leah, where my touch and evident of my hand was in the work. These next few images will illustrate some of that work from that time. I stayed for about six years. I've always worked in porcelain. The appeal is in its brightness that allows for a brighter glaze response and in its fluidity that captures movement and gesture. And I believe these qualities are responsive to my, my uh, aesthetic sensibilities. I was also doing craft fairs, selling wholesale. I should say I was waiting tables at that time at, in the evening, making pottery during the day. And I felt that the marketplace was dictating what I needed to make and, and I was doing less risk taking. And I was looking for other sources of inspiration and dialogue within my work. And I looked into the Archie Bray Foundation in Helena, Montana. And the Archie Bray Foundation is a residency program where they allow about 10 people per year who are serious in what they do. You stay for one to two years. And it's a great place to take risks, wonderful facilities, and to have dialogue amongst others with your work. It was a great experience. And this is the Bray. I arrived in the winter. And then I also had the opportunity to do another residency back to back at Banff Center for the Arts in Alberta, Canada. And Banff, um, let me see here, Banff is uh, right here, Alberta, Canada. And then it was really during this time that I was thinking of the wheel as a tool to make parts for my pieces. And then there was a point when the work started to become more whimsical. And I started thinking, how could I achieve that same feeling of whimsy and learn that I could um, exaggerate handles and spouts? My, my computer just froze here, and I don't know why. Sorry about that. Um, hmm. Well, I'm, excuse me, folks, I'm not sure what happened. There we go. Okay. So I learned that I could exaggerate spouts and handles with, uh, to get that same feeling of whimsy, a whimsical feeling. I went on to do my graduate work at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 
where I found that the plant life was very lush and very dense and was offering me additional inspiration to my work. So I was looking at plant life to inform the color transitions that I might apply to the body of my work. And I began making a series of these that I called sauce boats. And often I would look at plants. So for example, the way a leaf would grow out of a stem may apply the way I put a spout on the body of a sauce boat. Huh, I'm not sure folks what's happening with my computer here. That's crazy. Hmm. Okay, it's moving along. Um, in doing my graduate work, I was also looking at historical sources and forms. So for example, the Rococo gravy boat that's oval and full bodied in shape. It's these exaggerated components that intrigue me, as well as the undulating lines and fluid lines of, uh, of these shapes reflect the manner in which I form clay into pots. This is a, a microscopic image from the Carl Blomsfeld book of plant life. And this is something that I'm also very intrigued with as far as I look at this and I see spouts and handles and little vases. And it's that natural environment that, again, along with the historical sources and references, um, give that playful element to the work that I'm often looking for. In the glazing of my pieces, I may think of a flower in bloom. So for example, the way the interior of the creamer is glazed the same as the exterior of the handle of the creamer, I may think about a flower uh, in bloom and the underneath side would be glazed the same as the exterior as if the flower was folding back on itself. And sometimes these uh, references are more obvious and sometimes more subtle. Oh gosh, this was not happening earlier, folks. I don't know why. The apern uh, is also something I'm very much interested in. It's a 16th, or I'm sorry, it's an 18th century um, piece done in silver. It's very elaborate. It's also, uh, it's typically used to hold sweetmeats or condiments or sweetmeats and condiments or, or fruit. It's often a large central basket with smaller baskets on the side. And it's this form that's intrigued me to want to make, uh, to, ex to experiment with flowers and, and to work into clay forms. So this is some of the first pieces I was doing with that inspiration of the apern. And then of course, getting into the tulipiers that have continued to stay with me today. So strange. This would be a candelabra. And then when I returned from graduate school, I returned to Asheville, North Carolina, and friends of mine offered me studio space. I did not have a high fire kiln at the time, so I was firing oxidation. And then generously, they offered me permission to build a salt kiln on their property, which I did. This is the kiln I built in 2000. And this is me as a happy camper unloading the kiln. This would be a, a menorah or a Hanukkiah. They're small, they're gradated in form. They, I can move these pieces around. Again, it's 
goes back to the apern of movable parts and movable pieces. I had a friend once tell me that when he looked at these, they reminded him of muscle men. And then I could always only see them as that. So I started turning the handles the other direction um, to change that up. And again, they can be configured uh, differently and they're gradated, quite small. Salt and pepper. This is what I call a sauce boat or a pouring vessel. And this is what I will sh share with you in the end. Um, I'll conclude with a four minute pre recorded video on how to put one of these together. So I believe all these, all this work and much more inform the work that I do today. This particular form, as I mentioned earlier in the video, is the beginnings of the oval bowl. And they have taken a turn. And you'll see that evolution in the next few images where I've changed the foot and the handle. And this particular one has uh, some meaning for me. This was a piece that was in the studio. I wasn't quite happy with it. Martin came in the studio and since I wasn't gonna keep it, he said, can I play with it? And so he started gouging holes in it and cutting it up and I went ahead and glazed it. And then in time after it was fired, I realized I liked it. I liked parts about it and it was offering me additional inspiration for my work. So I started piercing future pieces um, from that one piece and started having that negative space in the form. So I'm always thinking you never know where an idea might come from. And here is work from the, the beginning of work that Martin and I started to collaborate on together. This was a dinnerware set that he started uh, to decorate with the scraffito technique of uh, laying down the black and scratching through the inspiration here, tulips. And then of course, painting on other work or decorating, I should say, other work, other platters and things. Again, because of his painting background, he looks at these as a canvas. I think you can get the sense that Martin likes to fish. <laughs> and then this is uh, a piece that we saw in a toy store, in a window in a toy store or antique store. Um, we were intrigued by this toy set being completely intact and with the pottery, the, the china in the box. And we were thinking about presentation and how we could create work that also was presented um, in, a, in a different way. And so Martin started creating these boxes with the lids and then I would make the cups and fire them and he would also glaze them or decorate them. And we call them occasion cups and they're often used for wedding gifts or birthday gifts or, or something of a special occasion. Hmm. Am I still screen sharing? Just dropped. Uh, yes, it, we can still see your screen, but it's it's stuck on the occasion cup. Yeah, I'm not able to move. Hmm. There, there it goes. There it goes. Thank you, Vince. A vase, more vases, decorated, salt fired, as we mentioned earlier. And then of course the cork that we referred to in the video and the creamer and sugar with the turned cork on the lathe. And over the last several years, I was doing the Potter's Market Invitational where I've met several of you in the past. And this was the booth that I was using at that time. 
And I thought I would end here with a few images of our place, not in the winter, so you can see the close proximity of the house and the studio and where we live. And that's it for this segment of the work. I apologize for the uh, computer getting stuck there. That has not happened before. What I'd like to do now is um, stay on the screen for just a couple more minutes so that I'm not going back and forth. I'm gonna move this conversation over to teaching in the pandemic. And I wanted to show a few images so that once I'm off screen, I wouldn't be coming back on screen. Um, so here we go here. So I, I teach at Warren Wilson College. Um, it's 15 minutes outside of Asheville. Currently, we have 580 students enrolled this spring and, 400 and 140 are remote only. It's a beautiful campus, beautiful place to work. I've so enjoyed being there. I've now been there 17 years and um, I love it and I miss going out there every day. This is just a little bit of the campus. I included this image because that could have easily been me in one of the vehicles behind the cows. This often happens when they're um, transporting cows from one pasture to the other. It will slow the traffic down. And there's been numerous times when many of us have been caught in traffic with the cows. It's, it's great. I, have, I don't have any problem waiting. <laughs> fun to see. And then this is an image of work that, um, of supplies that I put together now. This is how it works. I, I make kits, I make, put all the supplies together and the students come pick it up. And then they're able to work in ceramics wherever they are, in their rooms, in their homes, wherever it is. So these, this is um, the process of putting the, the packages together. Back in the fall, when it was still quite warm out, late August, um, students were on the kiln pad where they could be outside and work safely at a distance. And I am teaching from home. I'm teaching from my studio, and this is what it looks like for me. Because they're making work, the students, it still needs to get glazed and fired. And since it's not uh, particularly conducive to firing the high fire kilns and buckets of glazes, we are now using bottled glazes, which is new for me. And of course, the students come down to the studio at a scheduled designated time so they can be distant and they're glazing their work. I included this just to illustrate a project that I started this fall, and I believe it will be one I'll continue to do even after the pandemic. And what it's illustrating is I'm having the students go out and dig clay, and we're processing the clay, we're testing, and uh, we're mapping out where the clay was found. And so this is a map of the campus of Warren Wilson, and there's charms hanging up there of where um, they actually found the particular clay. And then here's a student, we were taking down a wood kiln, a pit fired kiln so that we could do a pit fired outside safely at a distance. Okay, so from here, I'm gonna come off screen and be with all of you. Great, so. Here we are. I know the question I often get is how do I teach ceramics over the internet? And I don't have all the answers. It's new terrain. I'm figuring it out as I go. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm making it work the best that I can. And I think the best advice I had from a dear friend mentioned not to compare. And if I don't compare, I think we're doing okay. So um, yeah, so that's where we're at. So I'd like to go into teaching about the pandemic a little bit, but I'm also curious if there's any questions 
right now that I, I could answer if anyone has any questions so far. The only question we've had in the chat room so far is a question about the slipcast process um, mm -hmm. and what is used to make the form for the slipcast mold. How, how, do you, how do you create that piece? Right. Well, it can be created in many ways. And for that particular form of the pitcher, it was created with a, on the wood lathe. So that was a, a wood, a wooden form that was turned on the lathe and then the mold was made from that. However, it could be from a clay mold. It could be from a commercial mold. It could be from anything to make a mold from. That particular one was turned on the lathe. Great, thank you. If sure. anyone else has a question, um, again, probably the most um, efficient way to do that is put it in the chat and we'll try to feed those in. Um, but here's a question, other than finding enough time to create work, what are your other challenges you face as you create your work? <laughs> My own work um, is time, is time. And, that, and it's, I was just telling a friend not too long ago, when I first started teaching at Warren Wilson, I had come from being a studio potter, that that was my daily routine. And then I, I started teaching and I thought, oh, I can do both. And everyone, my, my friends who were teaching, they said, when you, when you figure it out, let me know. Because it is difficult to teach and be a full-time studio potter. I guess I was thinking one could do it, it's difficult. I find that I can only make concentrated time to work when I'm having breaks, which we do get. We get the holiday breaks from Christmas and summer and certain breaks like that. And then I have to, other than that, it's more fragmented in being in the studio. And I have to say having uh, deadlines such as shows and things to work towards are always a great motivation to want to be in the studio. Terrific. Yeah. And uh, Lynn asked if we can vote on our favorite handle for the pitcher, so. <laughs> <laughs> sure, but I wouldn't be able to pull them back up right now, but yes, yeah, yeah. that's true. Or, or you can just, yes, right. Crowdsource your design. <laughs> yes, yeah. So in teaching during the pandemic, um, what I'm doing right now is I'm teaching two classes fully remote and one what is called hybrid. And the way the hybrid is working, I meet with that class. In fact, I meet with them today online. And we, we have our class and then on Wednesday, they'll have time in the studio. It's a small class so they can be distant and work safely. I have them spaced at 10 feet apart to allow for getting up and down. And uh, they work at, on Wednesdays on their own in the studio. And then I'm with them on Mondays. And the other classes we're working fully online uh, where they have clay, I'm able to instruct and have conversations with them. I've actually started something different this time around where if we're working on a piece, um, we can actually turn our screens, we can turn the volume down, mute, and they can work on their own. And then I'm right there if they have any questions as if we were in the same classroom together. And that's been working out quite well too. I know when um, in taking a class, uh, as a student, you, you hit problems when you're struggling with the clay, trying to get it centered or a form going crazy. How do you help troubleshoot in, in, with a student in that case? Right, it's, it's a little tricky, um, but basically I can, uh, I can pin them. So I'm just getting them on the screen and we can talk it through. I'm also using videos as an instructional teaching tool. So at one point I thought I had to make so many videos to be able to teach and get them across. And a friend once told me, um, there's so many wonderful videos out there. Why don't we just use them? Or why not just use them instead of creating what is already out, uh, instead of creating something new. So I have, um, 
a, a bank of, of videos that I can pull up if I need to, to get a point across. Um, I also will meet students on campus at a distance and work with them in that way as well. So I'm, I'm again, figuring out how to do this safely uh, as we move along. I, I do want to give a shout out in the beginning when we all went on, uh, went into lockdown and went uh, to teaching remotely, the ceramic community really came together. I, I, it just was so touching. I mean, they, people were offering their resources at no cost, um, websites and uh, subscriptions, periodicals. Matt Katz offered his online glaze, clay, and uh, materials workshop to faculty at universities and colleges that we could continue to use throughout the universe, throughout the semester, which I did take advantage of. Um, everybody has been really uh, pulling together, sharing ideas, sharing projects. It's just been a great, great community. And, and no surprise there, really, but it's been really touching. It's been great. Mm -hmm. We've got a question uh, whether you're doing anything with your students and faculty in terms of having an art show and or sale uh, of student work. Uh-huh. Well, typically in the spring, coming up in April, I started uh, what's called the Spring Arts Festival over 10 years ago at Warren Wilson, where the students would uh, create work and sell work uh, at that time, and we would have it open to the to the campus. Uh, at this point, we haven't gotten that far if we're gonna do something like that, which I kind of doubt, but we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, we're not at this point, no, I would say. The students though uh, that are graduating will be putting on their senior exhibition and it will be in the gallery on campus with uh, a scheduled time for people to see the show. Mm -hmm. So a, a common problem for all potters during this pandemic is how to, how to sell their work. Um, with the closing of, you know, a lot of retail locations and, you know, pop-up sales or, or shows that sort of drive the, the market. Um, what have you done about trying to sell work during this challenging time? Right, thank you. Well, one is, um, I'll give a little plug. I have an online, an invitational online group exhibition coming up in April through Schaller Gallery. And most galleries that I'm aware of are exhibiting online. And so they do the advertising and people can purchase work that way. Um, so I am doing that. Uh, and I hope that we'll be back in person to do the um, Potter's Market at the Mint in the fall in September. So if all goes well, we'll be safely distanced at that time. And then uh, teaching workshops, uh, you know, that they, they're still happening somehow. And yeah. Hopefully that answers the question. But I'd say that we're doing the online and I'm hearing mixed mixed uh, reviews on that. I mean, so many friends of mine, they're doing a lot of packing and shipping and that's a lot of packing and shipping, but then they weigh out, well, they're not driving to a show and they're not spending the night in a hotel and they're not setting up their booth. So it's, it's a trade-off there, a, a different type of work. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got a question whether people can contact you directly to come see and hopefully purchase your work. They could, thank you. Um, they definitely could, definitely by appointment as we all need to be safe these days. You, you do have a website, don't you? That uh, would have a, a way to people contact you? They do, I do. It's leahleetson.com. Again, thank you. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, as Leah mentioned, uh, we are, the Dell Home is working to plan out Potter's Market at the Mint for September 25th, I believe, is the date, the last weekend in September. We are cautiously optimistic that we will be having an event this year. Of course, we had to cancel last year because of the pandemic. 
uh, right now. We, we keep, are keeping our fingers crossed. I, I was discouraged last week when I heard one of the experts say that it may take till the late fall before we have herd, herd immunity. But um, again, the question will be um, what, what can we do to have a, events safely um, it, in September? Um, and again, we, we are working in that direction with all intention that we will be able to have, have an event. Um, again, you can look at the Potter's Market at the Mint.com website to stay up on uh, information as that becomes available. Any other questions? If you want to take yourself off mute and pose, pose it yourself, feel free. It looks like maybe we're getting, uh, you, you've covered a lot of our topics then. Well, thank you. You know, there's so much more to teaching during the pandemic. And in some ways I, I thought I could just do a full, a full session on it um, because there's a lot of moving parts, you know, there's the pros and the cons and is it working um, for students? How do they feel? Uh, there's just so many, so many moving parts, but I have to say, if I, if I don't compare, it's going much better than I anticipated. So, it's, but it's definitely not the same. I'd much prefer to be in person, to have the community, to have the students working 24 seven together in the studio is, is definitely a preference. Yeah. Um, we just had another question. Uh, I'm curious if you've seen students be more creative with original ideas when they are working remotely. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if they've, they're more creative. I, mm, it's hard to say, but this past fall, I did a, a project where I asked them to make a piece that represented their feelings about the pandemic, whether it be positive or negative. And I, it was a great project and they really came up with some meaningful pieces that um, I think showed their creativity and I was, I was pretty impressed um, because they had different takes on it for sure. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Are, well, do you want to go ahead and wrap up with your demonstration yeah, video? I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. And this is just a four minute little video on the process of making a sauce boat. And then I'll just come back on and say goodbye to everybody here. So here we go. Whoops, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I don't see it. Share, stop share. Technology, where's my screen? Ugh. I think it's so many things that are up here. Um, okay, here it is. Can everybody see that? Am I still sharing? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Then share. Okay. There we go. Thank you. In this short video, I'm going to show you how I created this form that I call a sauce boat from start to finish. I sped up the process in the interest of time. Once the form is to its desired height and shape, then I will remove the throwing rings with a metal rib. I'm using a wooden rib to create the lobes with my left hand on the interior and my dominant hand on the exterior pushing in from the outside while I'm pushing out from the inside. And now I'm throwing the foot from the hump. I call the foot a donut. This is measured to the correct diameter of the foot after it is trimmed 
and then immediately put onto the pot where I continue to throw. Now I will let you know that the pot has set up so that I can turn it upside down to be able to throw the foot. Here I am throwing the spout. It's a bell shape. I throw them off the hump and later they get cut in half and shaped. And here I am cutting the spout to the desired shape to fit the form. I mark where I would like the spout to be a little higher than the top of the form. And then I cut inside that line to allow for a seam allowance so that I have space to attach the spout to the body of the form. Here I'm placing a center line so I know where I want to cut back from the spout all the way back to where the handle would be attached. I'm marking that off and then I cut. I'm now getting ready in preparation to pull the handle from the body of the sauce boat. And I am splitting the handle in the center there so that one side of the handle is attached to the interior and the other is attached to the exterior. I like this handle to appear as if it's one and integrated with the form. So it's being pulled from the body of the sauce boat where you don't necessarily see the attachment. After the handle is pulled, the piece gets cleaned up and then set to dry until bisque. Thank you for watching. Wonderful. You make that look so easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's done many steps. So I'm again, I'm happy to take any more questions. I'm so appreciative of everybody showing up. Thank you so much. So enjoyed it. We've had a lot of compliments and the, in the chats and, and thanks to you for putting together such a what wonderful program. Uh, love your studio it's it's beautiful and uh glad to have the opportunity to see that so is there a place in town in Asheville uh where you sell um and is shallow gallery the only gallery uh that you um are associated with right thank you for that question um lately i, I there isn't a place. I mean, I'm a member of the Southern Highland Guild in Asheville, and I've in the past sold at Blue Spiral. But with teaching full time, I'm not able to generate the work uh, in the way that I have in the past. Uh, so currently my studio. I'd love to have you. <laughs> Well, again, thanks to everyone. Uh, we're thrilled with the number of guests that we've had. Um, if, if you'd like to uh, send us any feedback about today's programs, uh, anything that you'd like to see in the future, uh, we're always interested in your feedback. We'll continue to try to put some programs together that appeal to, um, appeal to folks. So again, something to brighten up these dreary winter days is fun to see some beautiful art being created. We do have a program coming up in about two weeks. On um, February 25th, we're going to do a studio visit with uh, Amy Sanders and Ron Philbeck. Um, both of those, uh, Amy is based in Charlotte, Ron and Shelby, and they've been doing a lot of collaborative work together. And so we're gonna 
have the opportunity to talk to them each about their individual work, but then also hear from them about that collaboration process and, and how they do that. On March 15th, we'll have another um, lecture program from Steve Compton, who is a noted uh, historian, author, talking about the, some of the history of North Carolina pottery. Um, Steve has published a number of excellent books um, on, on various topics related to North Carolina pottery. So he'll be sharing some information with us then. Um, right now we're starting to work on additional programs for April and May, and we'll have details about those coming soon. Again, if you'd like to be on the mailing list and aren't already, either send me a note in the um, um, chat with your email address. You can send that information to uh, our email address, delhomeserviceleague at gmail.com, or you can go to the Potter's Market at the Mint.com website to, to view those links I showed at the beginning. We will, we have recorded the session today and we'll be posting it. It may take maybe up to 24 hours to get it posted. It'll be on our YouTube channel. Um, and also I believe it will be posted on the Mint's website as well. So we'll have a variety of different ways for you to get to, uh, get to this information. So um, Leah, thank you so much for doing such a wonderful program for us. Um, we're, we're thrilled with that. And again, lots of great comments that in the chat that I'll be sharing with you, so. Excellent. Again, thank you so much. I so enjoyed it and I so enjoyed uh, having everybody here. Thank you again. Thanks. <laughs>